Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Before we introduce this week's guest, I want to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters. Patreon is a great way to support everything Cool Tools does, including our newsletters, podcast, video channel, and our review website. This week, we want to give a shout out to David Boki and Allison Pesco Salido. To become a patron of Cool Tools, visit patreon.com slash cool tools. Our guest this week is Ken Goldberg. Ken is an artist, inventor, and roboticist. He is William S. Floyd Jr. Distinguished Chair in Engineering at UC Berkeley and Chief Scientist at Ambidextrous Robotics. Ken's artwork involving robotics, such as the Telegarden, has been exhibited internationally, and he founded the Art, Technology, and Culture Public Lecture Series in 1997. He co-founded the IEEE Transactions on Automation Science and Engineering. As director of UC Berkeley's Auto Lab, Ken and his students have published 300 peer-reviewed papers and nine U.S. patents. He's presented over 600 invited lectures worldwide. You can find out everything about Ken at goldberg.berkeley.edu. Hey, Ken, how are you? Great. Thanks for having me. It's so good to have you. So good to connect with you. And we are so eager to hear what you're up to and what you recommend. Oh, great. Well, I have to say, first of all, I'm a huge fan. You guys have been doing this for a while. It's an excellent concept. I always make the connection with Whole Earth Catalog, which I loved as a kid. And I, it's just so much fun to open up the various versions of the of cool tools. And just I, I could totally get engrossed by them. Well, That's so cool. I love that. Yeah, I think uh, David mentioned that you uh, were looking either at the old Cool Tools book or Recmendo book. And yeah. I think maybe it was David who said, oh, you should be on the show. <laughs> yes. Something oh, actually, like I that. I think you had Tiffany on it. Yes. Uh, we oh. had Tiffany on like a month or two ago. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, right, and, right. And, for, and for listeners out there, Tiffany and Ken are an item. They're a couple. So just <laughs> mm -hmm. clear things up here. Yeah. <laughs> two incredibly interesting people. And uh, so here we go with uh, something you've been uh, showing me, which is, Really cool, and I think tons of families need this thing. It's the bamboo charging station. And it's not for charging bamboos, but <laughs> it's the bamboo charging station. Tell us about it. All right. Well, I, I think many of you can relate to the idea that you have you have a bunch of, of, of things around that you want to keep charged. You've got your laptops, your iPads, your phones, and your AirPods. You're also the rechargers for, for those things. Then um, little, you know, LED lights that you want, drones. And what happens is, you know, I don't, my desk was getting into be this complete spaghetti tangle of all these different things. Because also the cords are slightly different. And um, and I, I, at some point you couldn't find, like things were stacked on top of thing stack. And um, so I started looking under under um, chargers and I, I just thought, okay, what's out there? and the, if you search on like the web and Google uh, or Amazon, there's very little that comes up or a couple of like kind of really uh, kind of lame looking things. But I kept digging around and I found this solution that is you can go out and buy. And it's this bamboo box that is absolutely just the right thing. It's it's got um, it's got like 14 slots. And this underbelly to it that you can put in all your chargers and everything, all your all your cords. And then the the fun part is you have to figure out. It's like a, one of those puzzles. You have to figure out how to get every single cord into the, the box <laughs> at the bottom, which I took a picture of and put on the web. Yeah, um, we'll we'll share that. <laughs> you fit, good job fitting that in. It is totally like one of those puzzles. Yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> But it's 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 so. Fun. I have to say, I use it constantly now. You can just sort of line up all your all your devices vertically, like you know, um, in a line, like a like books on a shelf, and all the charger the cords come out from the bottom, and you have all those to plug in. So I have right now maybe twelve devices being charged as we speak. So, right. So 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 it's kind of like to describe it. So a little box made of bamboo where all the the the, the appliance and electronics are, and there's, there's some cords that stick out, and on top of that box are these vertical slots like like a toaster 
and there's maybe a dozen of them, and you can slide in on top um, a phone, a laptop, a camera, whatever it is, and then the cords that are below, and you plug into them. So you you have the whole thing has a footprint of maybe I don't know um, a placemat or something like that. Yeah, exactly, perfectly described. Yeah, and it's not very expensive. You know, I put all the information on a on a on a website so that. Um, you know, even down to what chart, what what um, extension cords and various things you can get that all fit in there, and uh, I think yeah. that's, it's like 150 bucks. It's um, great, and we we were discussing the added bonuses that your teenagers. It makes it really hard for them to like grab a cord and run away with it into their room or whatever. <laughs> Right. That was the other thing. That's right. So cords <laughs> disappear, right? Which is when you need it, right? So they, yeah, yeah. And we also have a kind of a rule in our house, Tiffany probably talked about, but we kind of have them put the everything down, all their devices down before bed. And so now we have a nice place we can check where they are. Cool. Oh, that is interesting. Okay, so, so they have to come over there and put it away from them to charge, and you can see, oh, wow, that's so That's nice. Them. And that's is, if that's it, where everything goes when, when – uh, I remember Sabbath, we're talking too. to Tiffany. Yeah, you practice Sabbath with no electricity, right? Well, we're not that extreme. No, we just do no screens, but we turn okay. on lights and we drive cars and and all that. Right. right, right, right. Okay. But you can put your okay. screen away for the day. Yeah. Which is nice, though. That's that's so cool. Right, right, right. right. That's really cool. Um, yeah. So, so you have a kind of like a family. It's like a family charging thing. Well, I have two. I have two, Kevin. I have one in um, my office, and then I got the entirely bought the whole thing over again and put it in the kitchen. So we have two. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I made I made a version a charging station on my wall where I was kind of did cord management, and it kind of almost formed a little bit of artwork. All the little cords, kind of you know, following uh, rectangular pathways. But it's the same thing of centralizing and and making it permanent um, yeah. off off of a table, um, and it is remarkable how much stuff I was charging. I just lost track of it and you consolidate it, and it makes it very easy to just walk over and there are all the batteries, camera batteries. It's mostly for camera batteries and things like that. Um, so this is a wonderful a version of that for like a kitchen because a. Uh, you know, a battery station wall works fine in my studio, but not it in my kitchen. And also there's, you know, as you know, they're, they're changing the cords every couple of years. So you got, right. mm -hmm. you know, all the different cords available and right. Androids and lightnings. And so USBs. So it's actually, um, it's kind of, it's, it, it is kind of interesting to have it just. Right. Solved. What about near, near field stuff? Do you, do you do any of that? Near no. field. Oh, no, no. Near field charging? No. Yeah. I, haven't, I haven't gone there. I had something that I tried that and it kind of, it actually caused something to go on the fritz. So I've been a little bit Ooh. about that. Okay. <laughs> That's a little scary because I used those. I bought a couple of pat these thin profile pads that just, they look like a, a drink coaster. Yeah. They were like $10 on Amazon and they are really convenient. But that thing about putting, frying something there's a little. I can I can imagine you can kind of like glue one on the side, uh, glue it vertically on the side of one of these um, oh, panels, yeah. and then You're you right. just you just slip it in. It has its own little slot, and you put it right in. You don't have to put the cord in there. It'd be kind of cool. Oh, there you go. Because yeah, you, there's a spot I'm looking at right now on the, one of those um, those vertical you know yeah. veins that you could put a you put your disc on there. Yeah. 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 Okay. So tell us about um, another cool tool. This was really good. How about another one? Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always thinking you guys have already covered this. So stop me if you have. But the other, this thing is called the Swing Away Jar Opener. I and think this is the classic one. It's a classic. I mean, I love this thing. And I have never, I, what happened was I had this, I found this somehow when I moved into an apartment in Pittsburgh years ago. And then I used it. I carried it with me from every place. And I, it was like the go-to thing. And then I was talking to a chef about it and he said, where did you get that thing? And I, I basically tracked it down and you can get it on Amazon, of course. And it's called Swing Away Jar Opener. And it was describe, kind of, describe it. What does it look like? All right. It's a little hinge thing. It's literally like a couple pieces of metal. It kind of looks a little bit like a, a can opener, the old fashioned can openers. But mm -hmm. it's got um, this little adjustable 
you, you, you basically like ratchet that ratchets up so you can set it to the width of your jar or the diameter of your jar opening. Then you squeeze down and it gets a really good grip and then gives you a great torque to open okay. almost any jar. Cool. Right. So, so I've not actually ever seen this before. So it's, it's really long, and um, but it's about twice the width of maybe the largest jar lid that you have. And then it kind of it's kind of like it clamps on with this little squeeze thing. It clamps on to the lid. And then the longer part, it's like a wrench where you wrench it off. Is that the idea? Exactly. Exactly. And it gives you it somehow it gives you just the right amount of like extra torque. And you can do everything from take like, um, you know, how Elmer's glue tends to you can never get those lids off. Yeah, uh, yeah. it works for that because you could go oh, that cool. really small and you can twist that open or a really big like pickle jar or something like that. But um, I don't know. As I get older, I'm a little less good at this, <laughs> and I, it's good to have a tool. Yes, this is great. And I imagine, like, I mean, this thing looks like it means business. I bet it has never met a jar that it can't open. It, I I would take on a challenge. I, I think if you, yeah, you know what I mean. It's a, right. yeah, it's, it's seven dollars, which is a great <laughs> that's, price. That's crazy. That's a great price, and. Uh, that's one of these things every once in a while I click on the buy now when I'm talking to somebody on cool tools and, and I clicked on the buy now for this. <laughs> Great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's uh, coming on March 3rd. It's coming tomorrow. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> Amazon has them on like, you know, speed dial so they can. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so 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 that's great. Um, so can right. you keep keep going. Tell All us right. The other well, the other one is the litter bot, um, litter robot for cats. Um, okay. Cat litter, and there's a number of those kind of devices out there if you look. But litter bot um, is the best, and it's a beautiful design. It's basically a big cylinder, cylinder, right? That the cat gets in, and then basically it senses that the cat is in there, so it waits. And then after the cat is left, it will then activate. And what it does is it just rotates one full turn, but it's got this beautiful set of rakes and, um, and, 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 and screens inside of it that just sort of work to turn the whole cat litter upside down, dump all the refuge into the bottom, and then turns back around and smooths out the litter. Mm, wow. So I think for clarification, I think this is called the litter robot. Oh, okay. And I think it's Litter Robot 3, Litter maybe, robot. is the oh, most current one. That's right. Okay. They, they are continuing to evolve. So there, there's a, the Litter Robot 3. I think I have the 1. Okay. Interesting. I think I have the 2. You have it. Oh, good. I have it. And, man, people are going to say, you spent $500 on a <laughs> litter box. But thinking of – I've had it now for a year – and so at the price of what, like a dollar fifty a day or whatever, for not having to deal with the scoop and filtering, you know, yeah, I just it's it is a hundred percent worth it. So oh, worth it. I'm so glad. All right, so I I have to admit it isn't it's not a cheap item, but it's so well made that these guys. Mm -hmm. When I first saw it, I was like, that is a brilliant solution because it's you know you you can see you have you have one, so you know. But also, mine is now, uh, I think it's like seven years old, and I had started, wow. something went wrong, and I went back to them, and they basically said, they're covering it like they have a lifetime, they got, <laughs> like, let's diagnose the problem, and you'll go in and, like, fix the wiring or whatever. <laughs> like, they stand by this thing, amazingly. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. That is great. So so that's a litter bot. All right. Um, but I like it. Do you, have the, do you have the Wi-Fi version? No. What does the Wi-Fi okay. version do? It tell you <laughs> well, that, that it's all it, been done? It's the mission accomplished or what? It, it, it tells you when the uh, it's time to dump the litter oh, and see. to like to open up the drawer and dump it. And it also tells you if there's a fault condition. And I was using it for the first six months or so, but then I've just known now every two days it's time to clean out. And I never, I don't use it anymore. So I would say save the don't pay the premium of a hundred bucks or whatever it is for the Wi-Fi and just get the the regular version and you'll be fine. Oh my God. That's a perfect example of TMI, right? I mean, who needs 
a Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Next thing, the swing away, the swing away door opener will have the Wi-Fi version. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Come on. Well, maybe go. maybe you could start charging for not having the Wi-Fi. I mean, I would pay yeah. to not have it. There you go. Exactly. Don't send me notifications. I'll pay you not yeah. to send me notifications. Oh. Yeah, no. the no hassle, don't hassle me fee. Well, <laughs> no, we got a we got a, a stove, a new stove, um, about a year ago, and it 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 w- came with a Wi-Fi, and I was like, I don't want the Wi-Fi. And sure enough, the whole thing came, and the last piece was as you you know to install the Wi-Fi. I was like, I'm going to skip that part, so I just left that off because I don't <laughs> I don't want a Wi-Fi stove. That's crazy. Right. Someone's going to hack into my stove. Yeah, yeah, bad idea. That's. That's true. Yeah, and I, I just uh, bought a cheap little vacuum cleaner bot that had Wi-Fi, and I had trouble like connecting with it. And then I realized it works fine without it. So we don't have the Wi-Fi, and it's just another thing I, I don't need to worry about. Yeah, <laughs> right. well, that's really yeah. I mean, that doesn't speak uh, volumes for the smart house of the future. Um, mm. No, listen. I okay. We can. That's a whole other topic. But I'm <laughs> I, I'm big big into technology. But I'm not sure we want the smart house with everything wired in. Well, I I just I kind of concluded a little while, while ago that um, whenever you see the word smart in front of something, substitute the word hackable. Right. That's good. So, um, yeah, you know, the, the hackable that's really cat, good, whatever, the hackable whatever it is, the hackable house, the hackable city. Um. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. That's really good. A hackable litter bot. Yeah. Exactly. Right. <laughs> you don't want. Um, all right. Well, so, so I have a couple more to share with you. Okay. Let's hear it. I'll tell you, the big one is the bug zooka. Have you covered that? No. Oh, the bug zooka. All right. Okay. This one is a, is incredible. If you have anybody in your house who doesn't like spiders. Oh, no. but I like spiders. I had had two spit. I had, my only pets were spiders <laughs> well, or tarantulas. Not for you, Kevin. Right? My, my oh, daughters, my poor spiders. <laughs> my daughters are arachnophobes, and they will screech like bloody murder that there is. They have spotted something that might be a spider in any in any way, and I come running with the bug zooka. Now this thing is amazing because I only discovered it about two years ago. But it's um, again, you can get it on the online. But it's a it's very funny. It's like a long, um, basically uh, uh, pneumatic tube. And at one end, it has a sort of bellows. And so you can cock it by locking the bellows up. And then there's a button. And so what it does is you put it close to the spider. And then it, when you hit the button, it creates a suction and pulls the, biter, the spider into this little, little um, clear plastic zone where you can then study the spider. Oh, cool! And, like an oh, observation. We can decide oh. before before you off it or not. You can decide <laughs> yeah. whether you want to keep well, it. Well, I'm I'm sort of of the you know the karmic thing. So I take it outside. I take it far from the house, and then I open up and and sort of put it out there. So I don't kill them. I just let them back into nature. Mm-hmm. But right. But so it's, it's like a vacuum cleaner that vacuums it into a little glass bottle, kind of. Yeah. And the thing is, if you know about spiders, they generally are very tricky. They can jump. So if you try and sneak up on them, they'll jump off. And then you have, where's the spider, Dad? I don't want to sleep in my bed tonight. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. So this thing is amazing, though. It makes it trivial. And it's also long, so you can reach up into the ceiling, like when there's one crawling on the ceiling, and you can zap it and then Uh. take care of it. And this thing, I now have two of them, okay? I have one upstairs and one downstairs in the house. (laughs) This is great. Oh, I, I have something called the bug assault. Have you heard of that? Yes, I've seen that. That's pretty cool. It's, it's to get flies and you like pour salt into a little chamber and then you cock it and it's pneumatic and it shoots a high powered blast of like salt at the fly. And um, does it it's, work? It's not. It works. It totally works. And I love it. I mean, <laughs> now I like finding flies. And, and uh, uh, it's better than like a fly swatter because it's not squishing the fly on your right. It wall. doesn't squish. Yeah, it doesn't squish the fly. What does it do? Does it like automatize it? Or I mean, where does no, the fly No, no, it just like, it just, the fly is there. It just like, uh, it just Stuff. hits it. it. It's like buckshot, you know, it's like uh, bird shot or something. It just kills it from a whole bunch of salt hitting it. Okay. And then uh, you can just dispose of it. 
Oh, and it's right. much better than a fly swatter because it's like you can do it from a distance and you can't really miss. Like it's uh, fly swatters don't work as well. Okay. This works really well. Yeah. I well, love it. What's I, that called? A bug assault? The bug assault. Uh, oh, assault. Oh, oh, I get it. Yeah. Bug assault. Excellent. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Would, it work on well, would, it, would it work on spiders? It should. I bet it would. Mm. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Uh wow, bug assault. Okay, Good. all right. Well, and, and uh, so wait, uh, just finishing up the bu bug zuka. Approximately, how much does that one cost? Um, that's not that cheap either. It's probably about, I was, I'm gonna say forty dollars. Okay. okay, and it's like battery powered. No, no, no. It's just um, you know, you cock it, you kind of like pump it. Yeah, you pump it. You just pump it once. Okay. Uh -huh. it bellows. It's so mm -hmm. easy to operate. That's it's so cool. That's a good one. I have to say, I really, I, I, I really like that one. I, I want to make sure I just mention two other quick things. The, the best charger I've ever found for um, mobile charger is something called the Mofi, and mm -hmm. it has a built-in plug, so it's super oh. easy. It's about the size of a phone, so you can. I carry it in my pocket all the time, and you just, if you're running low on battery juice, you just pop this thing out. It's got the plug, everything, and it's good to go. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So it's a External battery, it's like a, yeah. Um, power power source, power brick, but but the, you're saying the cord is built into the battery, so you don't have to have a cable. Yeah, you never have a cable. It's called Mofi, okay. and it's so elegant, and you can just you know pocket it because it's about the size of your phone. Right. And then when you actually have it on, you can put it, you can put your phone up against it, so you can just sort of hold it up to your, you know, you right, can hold it right. like your phone just got a little thicker. But it's super. I found it's the best thing ever. And now they're selling for only 12 bucks on uh, Amazon. So that's a good one. And then one I think you guys will relate to is Pine, the mail system that, for Unix. Oh, my God. For Unix. Uh, that's, a, that's a blast from the past. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a Unix user? I am. I use Unix every day. And um, I have to say, I, I still use Emacs as my preferred oh, my tool gosh. for editing. But... Uh -huh. um, but Pine, or what's now known as Alpine, is um, still being maintained by a loyal cadre of users. And uh, I believe it's out of the University of Washington. And um, this mailer, you will see it has a huge following mail client. Amazing. And, and it only and runs on Linux or does it run on the Mac as well? I think it's only on Linux. It's a command line, okay? So it's- Oh no, my um, gosh. But it's so good. It's What's so good, good about it? All right. So I have, I, 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 it is, first of all, your fingers never have to leave the, the keyboard, which I have to say, I, I, I love the mouse, but I can, you know, the mouse slows me down. Right. And, and, you know, moving around, I, okay. I can do a lot more by just keyboard commands moving around. Once you get the hang of those, they become, you know, you can move your cursor around a screen, like in, when you're editing a document or anything like that, much mm -hmm. than moving back and forth. So that's, that's a big one. But the, the other thing is it has these very cool shortcuts. So very easily, like here's an example. Mark, when you wrote to me, you CC Kevin, right? So I can just immediately mm -hmm. three keystrokes and I could create a new mailing list for you and Kevin at Cool Tools and I name it Cool Tools, right? So That's great. I have thousands of these. So every time a student is writing a paper, I just create a little um, alias for the student, all the co-authors of that paper, right? And I name it like mm -hmm. um, Kevin Sigraph 22, right? So that means that, mm -hmm. that's, and then I can send around files and emails and updates and all this stuff really easily to the whole group. And but, but you have to remember what the alias is. That's my I problem. I, no. I forget what the alias is after no. two, two minutes. No, you'd be surprised because the thing is that I, I call it because I know the first name of the author, right? Mm -hmm. So it's Kevin Sigrath, I know, and I know it's coming up in 22. So that actually turns out to be surprisingly easy. But I have them for hundreds of things. Like I have plumber, right? I just type in plumber and boom, it pops up the name and everything, email address of the plumber. So the other thing it does is I have another aspect, which is you have little files that have little stock answers to things. And I, I have those, and just by hitting a two keystroke insert, it'll pop in a file of something else. Now, now I know Gmail has that, but you have to go over and click and templates and go down and, and storing a template is a hassle. This makes it super easy. So 
I, I could go on and on about this, but let me tell you, I think this single thing has saved me, you know, thousands of of man years. <laughs> <Personally. laughs> that okay. is really cool. So Pine, I'm Very I'm going to check that out. Yeah. And it does it integrate with Gmail? Uh, no. So here's the thing. I have oh. both. I have both. No, no, I have both. So okay. here's how I do it. I have everything go to Gmail first, and then Gmail forwards over to my Linux box that has Pine. Okay. So now, mm -hmm. and now when I, I CC myself, and so I see the email both in both places. So for attachments, there's a lot of things. And Gmail is much better for searching, definitely. They got that down, hands down, right? Find, right. Uh, finding anything in a document. And attachments, Gmail rules. But but for like, I, can, I can't tell you how often, I have both of them open almost all the time. But I will always, I would probably say I spend like 80% of my time in, in Pine or Alpine. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Um, just saying. Just saying. Just saying. Okay, I got it. Some of those functions, I, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, I was using Postbox and I'm back to, um, to mail. But yeah, I mean, there's, uh, I'm trying to think of, the, most of them have keyboard shortcuts, but. Um, yeah, you're right. You're right about that, actually, because um, Gmail does have keyboard shortcuts. So that's worth yeah, doing. Okay. Um, but it doesn't have the shortcuts for doing the things I just described. Right, okay. Okay, great. Well, so you have what? I think you have one more. Uh, Mosh. What's Mosh? Oh, Mosh. Yeah, Mosh is another thing. If you use a, um, an emulator, like a, a command line system, like a window terminal, right? So I'm always, I always have a terminal window open. But the cool thing is Mosh will have a persistent Windows. So what does that mean? Well, if you switch over to your laptop or you're, you're moving around and you reopen your laptop, it'll reestablish a connection and get you started right where you left off. So I'm not f quite following. Oh, uh, it's a little bit of a subtle point. Anyway, but if you use if you use um, if you use terminal a lot and connect mm -hmm. to a, a system, this will be a great thing if you don't have it already. And I didn't know about it until about three years ago, a student told me about it, and I love it, and it's really, really helpful. There's a whole lot of things. So, so this is for for Linux users. If you're operating in Linux, it's a way of kind of going back and forth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like the command line shell. So, what I'm just thinking, like, so say I have a Raspberry Pi, and and I have a monitor set up to it, and I open up a a, a sh command line shell or terminal. Could I? have that open on my Mac too? Is that what it's for? Yeah, no, I don't know if um, if Raspberry Pi supports it. I have to check. Oh, okay. But it's a it's a very lightweight, really nice persistent shell. So um, you could just look it up under Mosh, MIT okay. or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm taking a look. Anyway, wow. that's a little, that's, I admit, that's a super, that's more on the you yeah. know, extreme end of the geeky side. That's but, okay. Yeah. That's, we need we, to have those outliers once in a while we, on the show. Like so, 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 Ken, tell us about what you're working on these days and what your um, your current project is in the last couple of minutes we have. All right. Well, I'm, I'm just really quickly, I'm super excited. I have this fantastic group in the lab. We are up to 40 uh, students now. There's, there's four postdocs, 12 PhD students, and like 20 undergrads. So they're just amazing, and, and they're coming up with ideas all the time. The, the big thing we're, we've been working on is, is grasping, still trying to pick up objects, which I've been working on for 35 years. But um, we've recently made some, some progress, and it's something called DexNet, which was, if you look it up, uh, D-E-X-N-E-T. But um, we, turned, we, we started a company, and it's now called Ambi, Ambi Ambidextrous Robotics. And um, there we were actually doing real products. And so, the, 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 what was the big breakthrough that you had to, to do Ambi? In a nutshell, Kevin, it was the idea of using deep learning, but in a very specific way. And it mm. was combining classic techniques, which have to do with physics and mechanics, with, 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 with stochastic noise, and then generating lots of training examples with 3D objects that we found online, 3D models, and then training this thing so that it could very quickly learn to basically what what JJ Gibson calls affordance, like we just learn where to grasp something. And, and it, is it transferable? I mean, once once it's learned it, then you can kind of port that over to the next hand. We'll call it. So the hand doesn't necessarily have to relearn everything. Each hand, you once you have this sort of knowledge, I would say, does does that 
can you just kind of import that to all the different hands for grasping? Well, it, it's a great question. In a, yeah, in a sense, yes. One thing is you do have to retrain it. So if you have a three-fingered hand, or what's really interesting is a one-fingered hand, also known as a suction cup, then <laughs> you, have to, you have to retrain it with examples of that. But it turns out, and we did that, we we generalized this to that to suction cups, which is what industry uses. Mm -hmm. and, and you can retrain on the same framework and it works. And it's been surprising to us how well it generalizes to new objects, things it's never seen before. Okay, that's the, that's the, that's the main training is on new objects. Okay, but the hand itself, um, I mean, once you... Once a hand learns to handle one object, in theory, all the other hands that you made, you'd be able to port over that network or that knowledge to that hand, and it could it could be at least as good as the last one, right? That's right. That's right. And so I also want to make caveat. You know, we haven't solved the problem. It's still it's a, there's still failures, and it's still a complicated. It's a very hard problem, but um, it's been really exciting to watch this come out of the lab and actually being used, and it's being used to handle packages as we speak. So that's been super exciting. And then the last thing I'll just mention to you is um, a project that's actually a, uh, an art and science project. It came out of the Telegarden, something we did 25 years ago, where we let people control a real robot in a living garden. And that was online for nine years. And then I've always wanted to come back and revisit it. But now the new idea is rather than have it be about the Internet and about people connecting over the web, this one is about AI. And so the question is, can a robot learn to tend a living garden? And, and the answer is? The answer is probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to try it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to try it anyway. And it's, uh, it's a really, it's, that's why I, I'm so excited about it, because the complexity of nature is so interesting and, and, and nuanced yeah, and, yeah. and complex. And we're, by the way, it's a polyculture garden. So you're trying to grow lots of different plants in close proximity. And right. you guys know when you try and grow stuff, it doesn't work. It's very tricky. It's hard for humans to do. It's very hard for humans. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. So so the idea, though, you say tend to garden, I mean, simple things like water it, weed it, maybe prune it, pick fruit, whatever, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's what it does. It basically waters and prunes yeah. and then also sets up, um, it, it optimizes the planting, the seed. Mm placement for um to 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 maximize diversity right and and growth so right in, in in my you know optimistic scenario the next hundred years most of the farming is going to be done by robots and so this is obviously a huge uh achievement if we were able to to do that and and because as you probably know polyculture gardening is really the avant-garde right now right. because it's all about you know you can you they're more resilient to disease yep you use less pesticides and um, the better water, you know, they, they have re require less right, right. irrigation. So it's really it's really smart to do that. All these um, early cultures have been doing that. I mean, it's still, sure. it's still done. But polyculture is really very labor intensive. That's right, really right. A, yeah. Right, so, right. So, so if you have if you have the labor of robots, then what's you know, it's, it's, it's a little smaller costs and that would be really great. Yeah. Um, yeah. A hundred percent there. Um, that's really cool, uh, and I can see why it would be complicated because, it, as you know, we just said, it's even tough for humans to figure out how to do it. So um, more power to you. I hope you guys figure it out soon. Well, we're having fun with it, and it's partly, it's, I think it's an illustration of the limits of AI, right. which is, you know, I think it's really important to point out. I think we're making a lot of progress, but there's some big, big barriers out there, and I think right, we're, right. we're going to, you know, be tackling those for right, right. Future. My only little suggestion is I always like to use the plural AIs just because I think that's what it is. Okay. So <laughs> the limits of that AIs, for me. plural. <laughs> Many species. Many species. Well, that, like that's so the thing is the difference between the general AI, right? So that the, the, there's even many species of the general. So, okay. All right. All right. Well, well, how about the conversation, conversation about that? <laughs> I know, I know, I know how you because I, I really like, and also your idea of um in the the hybrid of human machine, yeah, this, the right. centaur stuff, yeah, centaur stuff, very interesting, yeah. and I'm really that's that's actually been an active area of research in the lab. Well, fantastic, and thank you. We we really enjoyed your fantastic picks, and really enjoyed the the cool tools and um, this update on your work in the robotic lab. And so, thank you for being this. Was so fun. Uh, you know what I'd love to do in the near future is have you and Tiffany on at the same time. Okay. All right. That would be cool. Okay. 
All right. <laughs> we should do that. You're both such interesting people. And uh, this was a lot of fun, Ken. Thank you so much. Well, the feeling is mutual, you guys. I've been big fans of yours for a while, and I really, really had a great time. So happy to do it anytime. Hey, everybody. It's Mark from the Cool Tools podcast. I want to thank you for being a listener to Cool Tools. And I also would like to let you know about our Patreon page. If you would like to support the Cool Tools show, as well as our video channel, the website, and all the newsletters that we do, you can go to patreon.com slash cool tools. That's just one word, cool tools, and pledge any amount you want. You could even pledge a dollar a month. Every little bit helps. We have editors. We pay for transcribing costs. We pay our reviewers. Every bit of money that you contribute goes towards supporting the show. I'd like to give a shout out to our supporters of the Cool Tools podcast. This week, I'd like to thank the following Patreon supporters. Bill Schuler, Bob Kay, Ryan Pelly, Carl D. Patterson, Chad Cosby, Chris Wheeland, Chris Weirstook, Craig Tooker, Dan O'Brien, Dean Putney, Donnell Cunningham, Evan Barker, Graham Medlin, Hans Riesbeck, Helen Hegedus, Jerry Kearns, Jim Lesko, Jim Spofford, John Pollock, John Burdenbau, Keith O, Ken Altman, Les Howard, Lauren Bast, Mock Nerd, Malton Make, Mark Goebel, Matt Gromes, Michael Douglas, Michael Jones, and Michael Pecorini. Thanks to all of you for supporting the Cool Tools Show. We really appreciate it. <laughs>